Good morning. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. I'm David Edge. I'm your servant in Jesus Christ. I have a few announcements here for you. Uh, first is midweek. So we are having midweek, and at 6 o'clock especially, we are having dinner. 5 o'clock is a family experience, and then at 6.30, we'll have the adult classes and confirmation. But uh, we want to highlight midweek for the dinner time because we need some extra people to be able to volunteer to sign up. Uh, to provide the meals. So if that's something that you're interested in, we have a sign-up sheet in the back of the fellowship hall or talk to April. Next is table talk. We're having table talk uh, this Thursday at 6.30 over at the Landon Winery. And so if you're able to make that, uh, Will, I'm sure, has a really good topic. What's the topic, Will? The Feast of the Bible. Man, that sounds great. Let's do that. So that'll be uh, Thursday at 6.30 over at the Landon Winery. Uh, Next, we have a women's event. If you are a uh, a teenage woman or a woman itself, then uh, if you're of the woman persuasion, uh, at uh, Friday, this next Friday, April 19th at 7 o'clock p.m., that there's a specialty recipe exchange and fellowship event. Um, If you're not able to make this, but you still have a unique recipe like gluten-free or whatever, uh, then you can email it to our church office and we can still share that. But uh, hope, hopefully you can make it and uh, we'll also have a, a devotion time for that. All right. And then Sunday, Sunday. And so this is going to be this next Sunday. Wear blue if you're able to. Royal blue its the uh, color of our church body, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And Uh, We're going to celebrate our 177th birthday, and so as we do so, we'll have ice cream after this service. So wear blue if you can. Join us for ice cream after this service next week. April has a couple of announcements. There you go. Thank you. Oh, I guess Dr. Certain, you, you also got something. Thank Go ahead. Pastor. Yeah. Yes. All praise team members, if y'all would come and see me at the end of the service today up front, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Well, very good. We have a baptism today. Today we're looking at 1 John chapter 3, where uh, we're going to see that we are children of God. Uh, what does that got to mean? Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 is our text. Uh, and as we get to uh, enter uh, into this uh, time, let's go ahead and rise and greet those around you, and then we'll begin with their baptism.
You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the father of all mercy and grace has sent his son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the baptism rite is the acknowledgement of her name. And so what is her first, middle, and last name? Audrey Elaine Snodgrass. Audrey Elaine Snodgrass. Receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing and washing of your holy baptism. Through baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Audrey according to your boundless mercy and bless her with the true faith in the Holy Spirit that through the saving flood all her sin, which has been inherited from Adam and which she herself has committed, would be drowned and die. Lord, we ask that she be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with the fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believing believers in your promise, she would be declared worthy of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite the children to come forward as they uh, are going to use this as their children's message. So I invite the children to come forward uh, during this time. And so what we'll do is we'll have you guys seated right along here. And you guys can be seated on the floor right here. And part of the reason for this is that, you know, sometimes it can feel as, as kids that you might be a little left out. Sometimes it's hard to see the baptism to see what God is doing. And so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to hear that, that, that Jesus tells the kids to let the little kids come to him. And so let's hear the gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter into it. And he took them up in his arms, and he placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now get to pray this prayer as Jesus has taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. During the baptism rite, if uh, children are unable to speak for themselves, that we will have the parents and the congregation will speak on her part. Of course, she is able to say some things, but... <laughs> and, and by the way, um, what we believe here is that Audrey does have her own individual faith. It's not that we... It's not that she does not have faith. She's going to receive this faith uh, given by God. But developmentally, she's unable to say some of these things. But if she could say it, then she would, because this is what the Holy Spirit has given her. And so I'll ask the parents on Audrey's behalf, Audrey, do you renounce the devil? If so, then say, yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his works? Say, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes. Say, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. If so, say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Audrey Elaine Snodgrass, do you desire to be baptized? Say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. All right, I'll take her. Take Audrey. I know. I know. <laughs> Audrey Elaine Snodgrass. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Audrey. <laughs> Audrey, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthened you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. We got a few things here for you. First off, we got a candle. We have a baptism candle, and you can light this every anniversary. So every April 14th, to remind you that not only today did she receive Christ, but today uh, she receives Christ as the one who's the light of her world. Also, I have a white garment. And so that's yours to keep. And you can remember that just as that is white, her sins have been made white. We also have... I'm talking. We also have a blanket here that was knit by our uh, afternoon quilters group. And they have made this in a very loving and praying way so the way it can cover her. And let's see if she'll let me do this. But we want to welcome the newest family, the newest member to God's family, Audrey Elaine Snodgrass. Thank you. I invite the congregation to rise as we get to sing our baptismal hymn, Father Welcomes. Uh, kids, you may return to your seats as well.
Let us now confess our sins to God, our merciful Father. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We are by nature sinful, and we have lived as your thankful and joyful people. We have indeed turned away from one another in our thinking, speaking, and doing. We have done the evil you forbid and have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for these sins. Have mercy on us, gracious Father. Forgive us all that is in us. Blot out our sins and with the power of the Holy Spirit, Direct our lives so that we serve you in true faithfulness. Grant us steadfastness among all the changes of this world and build your kingdom among us here through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We take a moment and silently confess our sins to God, our Father. Friends, God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to him. May he keep you by his grace, by the Holy Spirit, and grant you a victorious life on earth. And finally, a triumphant life with him in heaven forever. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As well-loved Easter people, rejoice and be glad you are free indeed. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we get to spend time in God's word. The first reading this morning is uh, from the Acts chapter 3. While the lame man, who was now healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? as though by our power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by his faith, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, 
that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson this morning is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should call the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise team, please come forward and and position. Praise team, please come forward at this time. And congregation, please be standing for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated as we'll sing our sermon hymn together.
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a, maybe a, a growing faction of, of Christians that I, I've noticed maybe over the last couple decades that uh, really want to differentiate themselves from, let's say, cultural Christians. That when they look around at, at Christianity in America, that they might see plenty of people who really see Christianity as something that you only wear a, a certain kind of t-shirt or listen to certain radio stations, but they're not really taking their faith very seriously. Uh, and so there's a number of, of pastors and, and churches that look within this and, and they would say, we don't want to be simply a cultural Christian. Being a Christian is not simply about the kind of shirt that you wear or even technically belonging to some church, but instead really what Christianity is about is about our commitment to God, about us really having a faith, a strong faith in God. And in many ways, I, I certainly agree with that, and I think I would also uh, admire their dedication to really uh, taking their faith seriously and not simply uh, becoming a cultural Christian, someone who uh, might only care about uh, looks versus really what goes on in our hearts. But I got to tell you that while I might appreciate their robustness and, and maybe their ability or their desire to really kind of, we're going to really take our faith seriously, we're really going to read the Bible, we're really going to commit to God, and while I appreciate that, I think... What happens maybe a couple of months after you really make your commitment? What happens maybe after you're really reading the Bible, not like anyone else, but you're really going to read it and, and you're going to pray and not just say a couple words, but you're really going to mean it and, and you're not just going to attend church, but your mind is really going to be in church and you're, you're going to volunteer. And what happens later on when maybe your own commitment is not, doing so well and you know maybe you're still kind of becoming or you're still doing various things but where really is is your heart and then it's moments like this that the devil comes to you and asks well you know you said that you don't want to be someone who just kind of goes through the external works uh what are you doing well you just attend church you just read the bible you just watch christian movies you just listen to Christian radio, aren't, aren't you becoming that thing that you said that you're not? You're, you're not better than anyone. You know, it's almost like um, church then becomes a, a place where you feel inadequate, that if the preaching and the really ethos of the church, if it's only about us trying to become these super committed Christians, on the one hand, I respect that. But if that's really what we're about, if we're only about our commitment to God, well, what happens when we're not feeling it? What happens when we're starting to fall a little short of that? Where, where do we go? And, and, then, and then it becomes kind of mocking that everyone else seems to uh, be getting this but me. It's kind of like when I go over to uh, some of these muscle gyms, you know, and I'm over there at a gym. It's like everyone's in really good shape except for me, you know. And, and is, is that church? Is it like everyone seems to have it together? Everyone's super committed. Why can't I? That's what we're going to address today. What does it really mean to be in God's family? How do we get into God's family? Is it through our commitments and, and by us devoting ourselves? Um, or... Where, where is God's grace, and what is his role in this? Let's take a look at our text today, John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read this, we'll pray, we'll look at the context. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we see that our identity is that we are children of God, that we are your children, and so we are. You've called us, 
You've given us love. Uh, but Lord, we, we want to pray for all of those who are struggling with that, who uh, might know that on paper, that's true, but they don't necessarily feel it. Uh, and we, we know sin in our world creeps in, and so does doubt. But Lord, we ask that we can have a stronger commitment to you, but that, that is based on not only our works, or based not in our works, but in your gift to us, by you calling us your children. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord our God. Amen. We're in chapter 3 of 1 John. So over this Easter season, uh, we're going to be looking at the epistle of 1 John. And we're not necessarily doing the entire book because last week we started with chapter 1. Uh, and now we're already in chapter 3. But throughout the Easter season, so for seven weeks, we are looking at 1 John. And today, uh, chapter 3 is about being children of God, but the context of it actually goes back a couple of verses, and it's this. So in chapter 2, verse 28, I want to read to you this. And now little children abide in him. Him is referencing God. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And then we get into uh, chapter 3, verse 1, that he is the one who gives gives us love. He's the one who calls us as his children. But notice this. Little children abide in in Christ. Why? Well, we we abide in him. He calls us children. uh, And we get to spend time with, with him. And why do all this? Because when he comes back a second time, it's not that we're going to do so in shame, but we're going to be made righteous at that point. So we can have a, have a trust. Uh, and so this is true for anyone who's been born, been born of Jesus. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Uh, I had a professor at seminary, and what he said is that always look at who's doing the verbs. You know, I don't mean to get so bogged down in grammar, but think about this. Um, who's doing the verbs? Well, you are the subject, in a way, of this sentence, but only with passive verbs. So what kind of love the Father has given to us? So the Father gives us love that we should be called children of God, or another way to say it, is that he calls you a child of God. So who's doing the verbs? It's not that we're the ones who, if we could just have enough love, then we get to be called children of God. No, the Father gives us love, and he already calls us as his children. Pretty cool, huh? In fact, let's look further uh, into this. In verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now. It's not that we got to wait for something. Today, you are God's child. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So you are a child. You are beloved. You are God's child now. And if anything, it's only going to get better. See, what what God is going to do is that when we uh, experience the second coming, if you are alive at that point, then that means that what you will become is something even greater now. But you are already his child. It's not that you're going to be more of a child. No, you are a child now. But when Christ comes back, whether we are alive or whether we've already died, that either way, then our righteousness and our holiness will be made complete. And then all of the sin that's on us that so easily entangles, that's going to be completely thrown off. And so that today we have the identity of being a child of God. We get to grow in our love and trust in God. We get to abide with him. But when he comes back, then it's going to be even sweeter. It's going to be even more uh, pure than even we are today. If we were to look down at verse 9, we have this where John says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning 
because he has been born of God. Someone might say, wait a minute. You're saying that in order to be a Christian, it means we don't sin anymore? Because John says in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and we call God a liar. So we, we know that that's true. But what is he talking about here? Well, on the one hand, you are fully someone who is a sinner, but you are also someone who has been made new in Christ, and that's what John is talking about here. So it's not that this is a contradiction, but yet, admittedly, there's a little bit of a tension. But John, in the same letter, just two chapters later, says not the opposite thing, but he's holding both truths here. That he's saying that you are a sinner, but that also someone who has been made new in God then we get to not have sin. And in fact, that's going to be really true when he comes back. But you might say, okay, well, how can I get into God's family? I want that. I want to be in God's family. How do I stop sinning? How do I have my identity in God? Well, just looking at this one verse, we can help answer this question. And especially for any one of you who are struggling with your identity as being one of God's children. Like I said at the earlier outset that there are, are Christians out there and, and many in American Christianity, uh, I appreciate what they're getting at. They really want a real discipleship. They really want to kind of um, take their faith seriously and they want uh, us to not just be so mild and, and, and so lukewarm in our, in our lives, but instead we should take our faith seriously and and we should really commit and we should really love God with everything we have and I appreciate all of that but let's unpack this because it's not simply that if we could only become a super Christian or if we could uh, really take our faith seriously if, if only we could really commit to God with all of our hearts with all of our minds then we can maybe become in God's family no, that's not, that's just not what we see in Scripture. That's not the order of we see in Scripture. And so notice here that first off in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, this verse here, he talks over and over again about how we're born into the family. I don't remember being born. I don't remember, uh, or rather, I also uh, did not choose to become a member of my own family. And, and in fact, some of you... Um, <laughs> You might say this half-jokingly, but if you had a choice, you would not have picked your family, right? I mean, because, well, okay. So you didn't have that choice. No one asked you. No one asked you if you even wanted to be born. You, were, you just kind of were thrown into this. Like, you just kind of wake up one day, and, and you have, like, a, a, a kind of awareness. And, and that's, just, that's just what it is. So if you're born into God's family, first off, that means that this is God's action, he is the one who gives you birth. So we talk about being a born-again Christian. That doesn't mean that you made another commitment toward God. It means that God is the one who made a commitment toward you. He accepted you. Okay, so you're born into the family, but we also see abide. We see this word come up a number of times as well, that God's seed abides in him. It's going to abide in you. To abide is to spend time with someone, to live with someone, to, um, to be with them. And so family members, we, we abide in the, in the family. You, you are uh, not only in the family on paper, legally. No, you're, you're with your family. Um, and then third here is that you start acting like the family. Uh, for, for better or for worse, you start acting the way that your, your parents do. Um, last Sunday afternoon, I uh, needed to fix one of our, our bicycles. And uh, so... I decided to, you know, get a couple tools out and in the garage, I'm out there and I'm working on a bicycle and uh, my two-year-old son, Jonah, he's out there with me in the garage and I need to run inside uh, the, the kitchen uh, real fast, grab a cup of water, then I come back in the garage and this is what I see. So we got Jonah there. If you can't tell, he's using uh, the, uh, the crescent wrench. On the steering wheel, which is uh, not, not exactly where I was, I was adjusting, a, you know, one of the, the spots lower of that. But, you know, he saw me do that, and so what is he going to do? He's going to grab the wrench. He's going to start working. And he was just so proud of himself. It just came naturally, right? So he's, he's wearing uh, pajamas that, that, that I bought for him. 
uh, and he's, you know, help, he's, he's helping, you know, but he's just mimicking, he's just doing what we do in the family. But here's a question, let's just say that as he and I were to be working on this, that some other kid were to um, walk in the garage, and let's say, you know, in the garage we have, you know, kind of old clothing and stuff and bins. Let's say this, this other kid were to put on, I don't know, like a jacket or something that, that belonged to my family. And he just put on the jacket and he grabbed another wrench and he also started working on the car here. Would, would that kid now become a member of my family? Well, no, right? That, that's not how it works. It's not that by wearing clothes that I bought for my kid and by um, doing things that we do as a family. It, it's not that that's what makes you a member of the family, but it's that when you are a member of the family, you, you dress like them, you act like them, you just, you just do family stuff together, right? We spend time together. So this is the order that God has, has given us. And this really is, I think, um, a, a huge thing, especially for any one of you who are struggling with your faith, where you say, I, I, I want to believe stronger. I really want to commit myself. And again, I, I think that that is a noble thing for us to do. And, and yes, that is the Holy Spirit convicting us, convicting you to say yes, that you should be someone who uh, reads the Bible more and, and prays and all this, that this is what we do as, as people in the family. But that's not what makes us in the family. And so maybe if you're, if you're struggling or if you feel overwhelmed or if you feel that you're inadequate, um, well, that's not what saves you. What saves you is the work of Christ. It, what saves you is that you've been born or been born again. We got to witness this this morning with, with Audrey and at your baptism, whenever that was. Maybe you don't remember it. Maybe you do remember it. Um, and, and what happens at, at baptism is, is that, you know, with, with, with Audrey, that God is the one who worked in this. And, and that's why we even baptize infants. We believe that God can change the heart of someone, even an infant. That we know that infants can love and trust just like they love and they, and they trust their parents. But they can also love and trust God. They may not be able to vocalize it. They may not be able to, to, to say all the words, but... God can change their hearts. God can give them the gift of faith. And just as you were born into a family, you didn't decide to become in the family, but you're, you're in the family, you can run away from the family. Maybe that's its own topic. But it's that you're in the family, but now that you're, you're in the family, you, you do what the family does. And you, you start mimicking. And that's what John is getting at here. He's saying that if you're someone who is in God's family, you're going to spend time with him in prayer, in his word fellowship of other believers. Uh, you're also going to start acting like Jesus. Not perfectly right now, but there's a day when he will come back and then we will have even our sinfulness will be taken away from us and we'll be made new again. But for today, what are we? That we are the children of God. As John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, that what love the Father has given us, he's given you love, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Amen. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll go now to our offering. And so uh, if this is something that you call as your church home, then we are called by God to give a gift uh, sacrificially to this congregation that also extends to help spread the gospel and help people in our community and around the world. We'll also use this as a time to prepare our hearts for the prayer of the church.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in your presence we find fulfillment of joy. And by your right hand, Christ Jesus, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sins and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of his salvation and confident hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, by the incarnation of your Son and the reconciliation of his cross, you have made us your children and gathered us into your holy church. Sustain the preaching of your holy word and its message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, among us and all the nations of the world, Lord, in your mercy, give peace, Lord, to our homes and enliven them by Christ's resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sins reign among husbands and wives, parents and children. Assure those who live alone that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. God of all comfort, you have compassion on those who are afflicted. Remember and have mercy on those that we name silently in our hearts now. In our special prayers, Lord, we want to pray for Dr. Timothy, who has lost his faith. Lord, we ask that you can bring him back into your family. We pray for peace for the Bryants, and Lord, you know their needs. For the Matil family, as they've had loved ones that they grieve for. For their niece, Lauren, who died a couple of weeks ago and they had the graveside service. Lord, we ask for healing and comfort for their family. Also for Cheryl's niece, Sydney, who died of cancer yesterday. Lord, for the families that are grieving, remind them of the resurrection and that they are still your children. And to your hands, O Lord, We commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, and we pray all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took breath, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
I invite the congregation to please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Go in his peace and joy. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We'll sing together our closing song, the doxology. So I invite the praise team up uh, as we will remain standing and sing the song together. Right? Or no? Oh. Are we... uh... in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.